we have two slide sets in the T beams and W reinforced beams. Usually most beams, they're gonna have a flange. So the slab here, we call this a flange. And the flange is gonna help the beam and the strength. You know, usually the top of the concrete beam is gonna be exposed to compression when you have possible moment. And in a case like this, this flange here is gonna help you out Professor, the compressive strength. Yes? We, can, we can't see your screen. We can only see you. Okay. It's good now? Yeah. yeah, we can see it now. Okay, great, thank you. So as you see here, beams and girders, difference between the term here, beam and girder, girder is like, like a bigger beam, a bigger beam that supports other beams. A beam usually just support the slab directly. And if you see here, you see here the beam, it has on the top, it has a flange, which is a concrete slab. Same thing for the girder, it has also concrete slab. And this concrete slab or the flange is gonna help out in the compressive strength of the beam. Here's a case, like for example, here's a, we have columns, which is this blue shading that you're looking here at. We call this grid lines, grid line one, two, and three, grid line A, B, and C. The spacing here is 30 feet, a grid line to a grid line, and in this direction is gonna be 32 uh, feet. And as you see here, you're gonna see a beam on each grid line and a beam in the middle. Going back to our discussion about uh, uh, one-way slab and two-way slab, in a case like this, when you take here 32, the aspect ratio divided by 15, this is gonna be more than two. Therefore, this is gonna be acting as one-way slab. And here it says, one-way slab. Why? Because the length, the bay is gonna be more than twice the width of it. And the direction of the load is gonna be in this direction here. So the concrete slab that you were designing last time, you just taking a strip here of one foot, Right? So the width of the strip here is gonna be one foot. And when we cut the cross section through it, so the section is gonna be like this. And it's gonna look like a rectangular section. The width is gonna be 12 inches and the depth or the total thickness is gonna be the slab thickness. It's gonna be the same as the slab thickness. Now the big difference between our slab here and the slab that we did in the class the slab that we did in the class was only one span, one bay. You can see in here, you see here, I have one span, and then I have another span here, and so forth. So it's kind of extended. So the beam actually, if you like to think about this as a beam when it comes to structure analysis, it's gonna be like this. We're gonna have plenty of supports. At each beam, you're gonna have a support to the slab. And then in that case, you're gonna have here a continuous beam when it comes to analysis. Don't forget, I'm talking here about the slab, not the one that we call it a beam. When it comes to structure analysis, we call it a beam. So have your supports. And if you know how to draw the model diagram, you still can be designing the slab. When we had simply supported slab, we did the moment equals W squared divided by eight. In a case like this, we're gonna have other means to do it. So we call this a beam. And it's shown as dash line because when you look on the top of the of the slab, this is gonna be kind of hidden because it happened the other side, like in this case. And then this one here, we call it a girder. A girder means it's gonna be structure member. It looks like a beam and it supports other beams. This is the reason that you call it a girder. What happened, each one of this slab supports the load directly, deliver it to the beams. And then each one of this beam deliver the load to the girder, and then eventually to the column.
Now, if you like to design the beam itself, this beam, when you cut a section through it, now a section through the beam itself, you're gonna see it looks like this. Here's the beam, and then you have the concrete slab. From a beam to a beam, we call this a beam spacing. And in our case here, the beam spacing was 15 feet in this case. Beam spacing in this case was 12 and a half feet. You say, okay. This width here is gonna be the distance from the center of the beam to center of the beam. The depth, effective depth of the beam is still, we call it D. There is no change. Total depth is going to be H from the top compression all the way to the top tension fibers of the beam. The width here, we call it BW, which means web width. Instead of calling it B, you can call it BW, but it's the same. Slab thickness, we call it H sub F for the flange. Some people call it TS. So this also known as T sub S. What is TS? Slab thickness. Also, some people would call this B uppercase, just so you guys know. And this one, you keep it as B. So, okay. I mean, either one of call out, it should be fine. There shouldn't be a problem. And AS, we still use AS, total cross sectional area of the tension reverse. I'm not going to be doing any change to my assumptions when it comes to rectangular sections or T sections. It's going to be the same assumptions. You're going to have the same stress block, the point 85 prime C. Compression block depth is going to be A. Compression force is going to be C, is going to be right here at this location. There's no change about that. Beta one is gonna be the same. The fee factor is gonna be the same. My equations is gonna be the same. I don't have any change in the equations. Just all of a sudden now I'm gonna have a T section. And my moment equations gonna be the same. Again, my fee factors gonna be the same. From slide set number four, I'd like to bring this back. So that you guys, just to remind you is what's going on. For this section AA, I have here two sections provided to me. Yes, okay. Here are two sections. Here is AA and also this is here AA. The compression block depth A we're going to refer to it by having this hatching. You see the hatching here? It means the distance from here to there is going to be A. Compression block depth. Same thing here. This gives you compression block depth. Not just the slab thickness. It is going to be also a little bit of the web. Just a reminder here. When AS goes up, What happened to A, lowercase? Does it go up or goes down? When you add more reinforcing, what happened to the depth A? It's go up. It's gonna go up, okay. So if I like to compare with this case versus that case, B versus D, what happened is neutral axis here was within the flange. When I added more reinforcing, the depth A in my analysis went down like here, correct? So at the capacity point, the difference between these two cases is giving the amount of reinforcing. When you add here more reinforcing, to this beam, when you increase the amount of reinforcing at the bottom, what happens? 
the compression plug depth A went up, right? And the neutral axis went through the whip, not just through the flange. In a case like this, we call this a rectangular section. In this case here, we call it a T-section. So someone's gonna say here, I thought it's T-section because you have concrete flange or concrete step anyways. I'm gonna say no. When it comes to analysis, the final say whether it's gonna be a rectangular section or T-section is gonna be based on the neutral axis depth or compression plug depth. If the compression plug depth is gonna be within the flange, I'm gonna call it to be a rectangular section. If the neutral axis or the compression block depth A is gonna be within the web, I'm gonna call this here a T section. And this explains here that it says rectangular compression zone and T-shaped compression zone. It is true that all of them, they look like a T section, but what I care about now is gonna be T-shaped compression zone or rectangular compression zone would we'll come to my analysis. Meaning in a case like this, my analysis can be 100% the same as a rectangular section. There's no change. All the steps, you just ignore the fact that you have this piece of concrete and this piece of concrete and just you continue on. And your width of the concrete is gonna be all of this B. It is not gonna be BW that you used to use. An example is gonna make it clear, I hope. In this example here, they give me the width of the flange is gonna be 32 inches, slab thickness only two inches, it's very thin. The depth also is given as 12 inches. Whip width is gonna be 10 inches here. You have three number nine for the tension rebar, which means AS is gonna be three square inches. This is all the information given to me, the data. And they say here concrete strength is gonna be 3,000 psi. Yield strength is gonna be 60 ksi or 60,000 psi. This is gonna be the steel grade. So at the beginning, I'm gonna to start to treat this as if there's a rectangular section. Forget about the T thing. But when it comes to the width B, I'm gonna be using 32 inches. So previously in the past, I didn't have this flange. And the width that I would have used is gonna be 10 inches. Now I'm gonna be using the 32 inches. Why? Because compression is gonna be on the 32 inches. So it's okay. Here's the depth 12. AS is gonna be three square inches. Look at this equation for A. ASFY divided by 0.85 V prime C three K psi. And look at the width, 32 inches. Look at the depth of the neutral axis or the depth of compression block. It's gonna be 2.2 inches. So actually, it turns gonna be here. It is more than two inches. You know what? If my number would have been less than two inches, like 1.9 or something like this, I'm gonna say, this is just rectangular section. Let me just continue all the analysis as is. I said, okay, good, 2.2 inches. So my analysis here, remember this equation. It says here 0.85 F prime C times B times A is gonna be equal to the compression force. If I may write the equation again, I'm gonna say C equals 0.85 F prime C times B times A, correct? Do you guys follow me? Yeah. So what does it mean by that? It means I have an assumption that this is gonna be my compression block. It's gonna be this rectangle, not this T shape. Because look at my equation, 0.85 F prime C, let's give you the stress value, times B, the total width, times A, compression block depth. So I'm kind of overestimating now the amount of compression force. If I just use here 2.2, if I like to back check my analysis, I'm gonna say, let's take here 2.2 times 32, times three, times 0.85 is gonna be equal to the total compression force. I'm gonna say, yeah, this makes sense. But in reality, I don't have any concrete in this area here and that area here. We don't have any concrete. So actually this 2.2 is wrong. It cannot be 2.2. It has to be this shape, this T shape. 
Therefore, this A is kind of lower than it should have been. And I'm expecting this A to be a little bit deeper. So that this little area here, if I may do it this way, you see this little area here? This gave be equivalent in size to do these two areas, this one and this one. Does this make sense? So the area of this little section is gonna be the same as the area of these two other sections. Make sense or no? Uh, professor, I have a clarifying question. Yeah. So you're saying that area that, that's inside of the T-shape um, is equal to both of them combined or both of them separate? Both of them combined. This area here, if I just take here this T-section, right? This T-section here, if I take this area here times 0.85 prime C, this should be the compression force. Not that nice section that I just put, because this section here is, is incorrect. You don't have here any concrete. So where's the compression going to? Usually if you do hatching, it needs to be through concrete, right? Now look at this section here. There's nothing here. This is air, this is air. Like in here, this is air. There's no compression on this air. Compression is going to be only in the concrete hatched area. So what should I have done in a case like this? Once I found out that A is going to be greater than HF, which means slab thickness, I'm going to say, you know what? My assumption at the beginning was wrong. I should have said here AC for the area of concrete. And AC is going to be equal to the slab thickness times this width plus this little piece of the web. So this AC is going to be the hatched area and take this AC multiplied by 0.85 F prime C to give it the compression force. Make sense or no? Yes, that makes sense. All right, far. Yeah. Professor, what, what's the difference between AC and A? Just A is an area. If you just A lowercase or A uppercase? Uh, a lowercase and then, yeah, it wasn't A sure. lowercase is going to be the distance from here to there. Usually, once you say A uppercase, it's going to be cross section of the area. Once I say A C, A sub C is going to be area of concrete. Okay. And so you're saying we have to multiply that by 0.85 F prime C in order to get yeah. what? Yeah, in order to get the compression force. So, what I'm saying is the compression force here, when it says here 0.85 A prime C B times A, what is B times A? You're going to say it's an area, right? So, you're going to say, okay, let's make it little bit more accurate for our case, I'm going to say times AC. Because AC now is giving you the cross-sectional area. In the past, the rectangular sections, we just used to say B times A, and B times A was just the web width times the compression depth, which is the same as the cross-section area of the concrete. So Okay, so we don't need to like redraw the line lower. We're just adding the extra area mathematically yeah and using that okay yeah so my analysis here my analysis says that this gave you here 2.2 inches but this is assuming that i'm gonna have here big compression blood right because look at my equation Just assume that the entire area here is exposed to compression force. Look at my equation. The equation says C equals 0.85 F prime C times B times A, right? Here's B times A. But the reality is I should have been using AC now in a case like that. In the past, AC used to be equal to A times B. That was not that far. Here's the compression force. 0.85 A prime C times B times A. What is B times A? You say B times A is actually is giving this cross section. Area. Let's say here B times A is a cross section area. In the rectangular section, that was very simple. I just say B times A. 
In my case here, I cannot just say B times A because I have here some air that I shouldn't be counting. And in a case like this, I used to have only one compression force. This is easy. And the compression force is going to be concentrated right at the mid height of A, correct? Now in here, the centroid or the CG of this, of this T section is not going to be where? It's not going to be at A over two. I'm going to have here two compression forces. I'm going to say, let me divide this into two forces. Here is one, and here is the two, a second. So I can divide this into two compression forces, right? I'm going to say, here's the first one, given the mid height of the flange, and here's the second one. And both of these two compression forces, they're going to be equal to this tension force. Because it is that simple. I see just summation of the force in the x direction is going to be equal to zero. So this compression force one plus compression force two is going to be equal to the tension force T. Where do we have that? I'm going to say, OK, it's right here. So I'm going to say this is going to be here A1. What is A1? The flange cross-section area. What is A2? The web cross-section area exposed to compression. You can see here that AC equals A1 plus A2. And if I take here, if I decide here to find out the total compression force, you can see here C equals, this gave you 0.85 F prime C times AC. Same equation I've used a minute ago. This gave you the total compression. So to make it easy for myself, I decided here to divide this compression force into two forces. One force is giving the center of the flange is going to be only for the flange. And you know what? I'm going to call it CF. C compression, F is what? The flange. How about the CW? C is a compression. W is the web. So I can call it here. This is going to be right here. The mid height of this web. And this force here is going to be the mid height of the flange. And with that, I'm going to have two compression forces. Both of them, they are going to be equal to T, to the tension force. Professor, I have a question. Yes. Um, it looks like that this was drawn, that line for A2 was drawn further down at 2.66 inches. Yes. Is it not? So we are drawing the line further down. Yes. Is that true? You can just draw the line and then change the numbers. You don't have to do it to scan, right? OK. And did. Do we just do basic geometry to yes. subtract out that extra yes. space? Yes. I'm going to be going through it now in details. OK, but are we not able to just mathematically keep it as 2.2 inches? You cannot. OK. Because let's say that you make it, this is a very good discussion. It's, it's a little bit earlier, but this is fine. I can go through it now. You can say, you see here your analysis for this? You say, OK, yeah, yeah, OK. So what does it mean? How much of the web are we taking here? Can you help me with this? How much is the depth of the web exposed to compression? How much? 0.2 inches. Great, 0.2 inch. I said, okay, good. This is very good. What is the total cross-section area AC? I need your help. So I'm gonna say it's gonna be 32. This is going to be here AC, right? 32 times 2, correct? 32 inch times 2 plus 0.2 inch times 10 inch. Am I correct? Did I miss anything? Looks good. OK, how much is that? 66 units, inches squared. Good. How about the compression force? 66 times 0.85 times 3. How much is that in terms of kips? 168.3. 
How much detention force does that start with? Well? Hundred eighty. Can you explain it to me? What's wrong with that? Hundred eighty caps. That was attention. That I started with, and based on which, based on this, I was able to figure out two point two. But when I say two point two, it means I assume that this air here or this void area, this void area here, was exposed to compression. Why it is not? So I had an assumption at the beginning uh, because I treated it as a rectangular section while it is not. Make sense now? Yes. Okay. So AC, AC is just equal to A1 plus A2. This is what I have done here. You see this? 32.2 times 2, A1, 0.2 times 10, right? Well, yes, I mean, but the correct way to do it would be to extend A2 and then AC is still equal to A1 plus A2. Yes, and we're going to be coming through this. But when it comes to steps of this procedure, I start first by assuming that this is just a simply rectangular section. Okay. And once the neutral axis is going to be going through the web, I'm going to say now it is a T-section, my assumption was wrong. But if the neutral axis happened or compression block that happened within the flange, you're done. This is a rectangular section. So, okay. Now let's continue with the example. So see here, we have two cross-section areas. We have A1 and A2. A1, I cannot change it. It's a fixed number. It's 32 times two, correct? Now, A2 is the one that I don't have the exact depth through the web that I'm going to be calling it here A lowercase 2. So, okay, here's A1, 64 square inch. How about A2 of our case, this cross section area, I'm going to say it's going to be equal to 10 inch times A2. It's good. If you add both of these two values together, these two cross section areas, apply by 0.85 F prime C. Right? What's going to happen? It's going to be a total compression force. And total compression force is going to be equal to the total tension force. Here's the first compression force in the flange. First compression force in the flange is going to be 0.85 F prime C times A1, which is a 64 kips. OK, it's going to be 163 kips. How about the force in the web? I'm going to say force in the web. It is going to be 0.85 A prime C times A2. What is A2 again? This cross section area, A2. Which is also equal to the big tension force subtracting compression force in the flange. Why? Because, as we said here, the tension force equals compression force in the flange plus compression force in the web. So I can say here compression force in the web equals T minus CF. I have numerical value here for CF and numerical value for the tension force, which means at the end of the day, I have numerical value for C sub W. Because C sub W is gonna be equal to the balance between the total tension force, which means the total compression force and the compression force in the flange. Here we go, it's gonna be 16.8 caps. In this equation here, I have one unknown. My unknown is going to be A lowercase, or first A uppercase 2. Look at this, 16.8 caps equal 0.85 times 3 KSI times A2. Here is A2, 6.6 .6 square inches. This means this cross-section area here is going to be 6.6 .6 square inches. And this cross-section area is going to be equal to A2 times the width BW. Now I can solve for this A2. It's going to be equal to 6.6 .6 divided by 10 is going to be 0.66 inches. This is the reason that now I have this as 2.66 inches. Here we go. 0.66 inches. How about the total depth A? Total depth A meaning what? This depth A, this is called here A, right? 
I didn't change the call out of this. It's still called A. It's gonna be equal to this point six six inches plus the two. This is gonna be A lowercase. Now at a point like this, now I should be able to find out the phi factor because now I can do C over T. I can do the strain in the steel if I want to. So, okay, here's a phi factor. First, take this A divided by 0.85, the beta one. Okay, 3.13. How about C over D? Because I'm gonna be going here to the chart to find out the phi factor. Look at this. This gave you 0 0.26. 0 0.26 means in this side, right? C over D is giving you in the right side. 0 0.375, 0 0.6, screwing up this way. So my phi factor here equals to 0 0.9. What should I do next? You can see, well, now I have two compression forces and I have one tension force. Okay, good. I'm gonna go back here, a few slides, just to this one here. Now I have numerical value for CF and CW. Also, I know where they're gonna be concentrated at. The resultant or the force location is gonna be at one inch from the top. Why? Because it's here two inches, I'm gonna have here one inch and one inch. Okay, good. How about CW? I'm gonna say this here 0.66 inches, meaning the distance from here to there this distance here, this little distance, is going to be equal to 0.33 inches. Correct? So, okay, this here, 0.33 inches. Now, can you figure out the moment arm for the flange force? I say, yeah, moment arm for the flange force. I have the depth D 12 inches. 12 minus 1 is going to be ZF. So, you can see here, this is going to be 12 minus 1 equals 11 inches. Let's give you the ZF. How about ZW? Do you have ZW? You say, yeah. It's gonna be 12 inches minus two inches, the entire plant thickness, minus 0.33 equals 9.67 inches. What do you do next? Find out the moment. Moment is going to be equal to CF times ZF plus CW times ZW times the moment arm for each one of these two forces. Let's go through. Here's 11 inch for the ZF that we have just done together. And here's ZW is going to be 9.67. And here's VM, VMN. The standard way of doing it. Nothing new. And the moment equals 164, 146.82 kF. foot. Of course, you don't forget to divide by 12 to put it in kF. foot. Questions? Do you have any questions? Professor, can you just remind me what lowercase c uh, that variable is what is the lowercase c yeah like what does it represent oh okay you the next is that professor uh i think i missed it where you were saying well why you divided two divided by two for the 11 inches and for the flange and the web oh you mean determination of the zf and zw yeah yeah Okay, all right. So I guess this is 12 minus two over two. Let me see what is the meaning of that. So I'm gonna say, this gave you 12 inch, subtracting two over two, why? Because one half of the flange thickness, right? Which means 11 inches. Okay, so the A over two? Yeah. Gotcha. Now oh, how yeah. about the second one? ZW, this gave you 12 inch, minus the slab thickness, minus one half of A2. Not clear to me. I'm going to see what does it mean by it. So it's going to be 12 inches, subtracting two inch for the plan thickness, subtracting one half of this, which is a 0.33. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. No problem.
So let me review this again. Rectangular sections versus T section. Once you see any, like this T, a T section, it looks like a T section. You assume at the beginning that you're gonna treat it as a rectangular section. So keep this in mind. If you like to put the steps, you can put a step like this. First step, treat it to be a rectangular section at the beginning. You solve for A. A lowercase. Meaning that you assume that your compression block depth is going to be within the flange. Let's give you your first assumption. This is the reason my analysis here, I said A equals ASFY divided by point A5 times C times B, and I use this B. It means at the beginning, I assumed that the compression block depth is gonna be within the flange. If my assumption is correct, I'm gonna continue and treat this as if it is a rectangular section, because I have a rectangular section compression block. If it happened that the neutral axis turned to be within the web, like in our case here, I know that now I have a T section will come to announce it. And in a case like this, the issue is gonna be the location of the forces and the actual compression block depth. Because I don't have a pure rectangular section exposed here to compression. I have it looks like a T. So I need to find out here the total area of this block. So I'm gonna decide here, my decision is to divide this into two forces. One force through the flange, one force through the web. The compression force through the flange is gonna be equal to the B, the width, times the A, the depth, or this is gonna be HF, if you like, times 0.85 by prime C. And the force in the web, it's gonna be equal to this A2, which means A2 lowercase times B web applied by the same stress, 0.85 by prime C. If I have the tension force to be a numerical value and compression one and compression two, I have the first one as numerical value in the flange and the second one I have it in terms of A lower two, A lower case two. It means I can solve all of that and just solve for A2. It's exactly what we have done. All of the steps here, just find out this A2. If you take this lowercase A2, add it to the two inch of length thickness, you're gonna end up by finding out A, compression block depth. And once you have it, now you can solve for C lowercase, neutral axis depth. And then you can do C over D, do the phi factor. And then at the end, you solve for the moment capacity. Let's go through another example and look what I have done. I took the previous example. I know that the flat thickness or the slab thickness was only two inches. I decided here to change it. I said, well, let me assume it's going to be three inches in our example here. See what difference would it make? Because I kept on saying, you're going to do the analysis, and if the neutral axis happened to be within the web, it's going to be a T-section. If it happens to be within the flange, it's going to be a rectangular section. So at the beginning, I assume it's going to be a rectangular section. And let's see what's going to happen here. We did the same analysis, and we ended up with 2.2. Now, the slab thickness is 3 inches. It means neutral axis is going to be right here. Right, because now this becomes your three inches, and this is not going to happen. Correct? It doesn't have any more like this rectangular section. Why? Because neutral axis of compression block depth is going to be two point two. Slab thickness now becomes three inches. You can say if a compression block depth is going to be lower than the slab thickness, you can have a rectangular section. So, okay, good. So, what does it mean? It means just continue the problem as if there's a rectangular section. You're gonna have here the C lowercase, just take this A. Now this 2.2 is good. You don't change it, you're done with it. And you just continue the problem as if there's 
few rectangular section. Now, if you like to use this equation, go ahead and use it. But you know what? This term here is not there anymore, right? We don't have it. Why? Because we don't have a force on the web. The force is only in the flange. And the depth of it is giving 2.2 inch. That's exactly what happened here. Now, I'm back here to the very old equation that we have used. Look at this equation. I'm back to the very old equation. And I just use it safely. And this gave you the trends of the section. So now for this given example, I know that it could have been the rectangular section or T section. I, I mean, you cannot decide unless you do the analysis, find out the compression block depth. Again, the compression block depth is gonna be within the flange. We call this rectangular section. To have it to be within the web, I'm gonna call it here T section. Not just because it looked like a T. No, you need to do the analysis, find out the compression block depth. Any questions? Any questions here? We're good? All right, so I'm gonna change here the gears to a new example. And in this example here, I have a concrete beam that has some notches. And this is used widely in pre-stress concrete and pre-cast concrete. So let's just say in pre-cast concrete because in here we are not covering pre-stress. So in this case here, I have a beam that has doesn't have a flange, but what happens, it has two notches. I'd like to study this beam and find out the strength of it. I'm gonna say, let me do here the analysis and consider it to be a rectangular section at the beginning. Let me find first the compression block depth. If the compression block depth happened to be within the four inches, I'm gonna call it a rectangular section. And the width I'm gonna be using my analysis is gonna be this seven inches, not the 17 inch. If after the analysis, compression block depth A happened to be within, let me call this to be the width if you want to, it means it's gonna be a T section when it comes to analysis. I'm gonna have here two compression forces. I'm gonna have C in the F and C in the web. So let's see. Here's the depth, cross section area, concrete strength, F sub Y, and then here's based on the A, the analysis. Look at the depth, 13, four, five. Wow, it's gonna be like here. So for sure now this is gonna be a T section, meaning I'm gonna have here two cross section areas. Here's one, and the flange, if you want to call this to be the flange, and here's the second. If you take the stress 0.85 F prime C multiply by the top area here, A1, because A1 is limited, it has numerical value seven times four, 28 square inches, which means I have numerical value for the compression force on the flange. And subtract this force out of the four number nine tension force. This gave you four square inches times six is gave you 240. You will end up with the compression force on the web because CF plus CW is gave you equal to the tension force. Now I should be able to solve for the depth through the web, which you may call here A sub two. Very similar to exactly what I have done in the first example, but instead of having to have a flange, a real flange, now I'm gonna have two notches, one on each side. Here we go, CF, CW, and look at this. When my analysis here says it's gonna be 13.45 uh, 
I said, this is going to be too much. It's going all the way down because it has the assumption that the width is going to be only seven inches for the concrete. While on the top four inches, it's going to be only seven inch. And once you go down, it's going to be 17. You can see here, CF is going to be based off a seven times four, 20 square inch, 28 square inches. And the second area, which means this is going to be here A2. If I may call this one here to be A1. And this is going to be here A2. Is going to be equal to 17 times A lowercase 2. I'm following the same steps I have used in the previous example. OK. Compression force on the flange is going to be fixed. I have numerical value for it. It's going to be equal to 28 square inches because this is here limited. 28 square inches times 0.85 prime C. This is giving the C in there. Compression force in the flange. Compression force in the web is going to be equal to what? 0.85 A prime C times the second cross section area, which is also numerically equal to the balance between the tension force and between the compression force and the flange. Yeah, here we go. 240 is the tension in the steam. And the 71.4 is giving the compression the flange. So here we go. The second force in the web is giving 168, which is equal to what? 0.85 a prime C times the second area. And the second area I have it in terms of A lowercase 2. Now I can solve for A2. It looks like a template, as if I use the first example solution, I just change the numbers. So whether I have a notch or I have a flange, I'm going to treat it exactly the same. Please remember this. Exactly the same treatment. I'm going to have here two compression forces. The top one is usually much easier. Why? Because this cross-section area here is 4 times 7. It's going to be 28. There is no change, nothing with it. The problem usually comes with the bottom one, that I don't have the exact depth of it, and I need to solve for it. So here we go. Now, in this give you your A2. You add four inches to it. What is the four inch? Which means this one here, you're going to have 7.89, your C value. What is C? Neutral axis depth. If you take the C divided by the depth D, this is your depth D, you can solve for the phi factor. Same thing. Here's the phi factor. Look what happened. C over D becomes 0.386. 386, here's 375. If you go this side, this is going to be lower than 375. This is going to be 0.6 and higher. So you're at 0.386. So this is going to be like 0.88. If you like, you can use this equation if you want to. This equation is going to be based on C over D to find out the 0.88. Or you can do graphically if you want to. Now we have the phi factor, it's going to be 0.88. And then we can do the same thing for the Z's. What is the Z's? This is going to be like the YCT distance from the force, compression force, this is a tension force. You can say, OK, let me go back. The first one is called ZF. How can I do this? I'm going to say it's going to be equal to 24, subtracting 2 inches. Why 2 inches? Because it's going to be 1 half of the flange. <coughs> How about ZW? I'm going to say ZW here, if I may write it down. It's going to be equal to 24 inch minus 4. Why minus 4? Because I need to subtract the flange. Minus 3.89 divided by 2. Why 3.8? Oh, I'm going to say because of this. Look, this compression force is going to be the mid height of A lower case 2. Now I have these two values, right? I have the moment arm. So at the end, the moment equals CF times ZF plus CW times ZW. This also reminds me with what we have done in the uncracked concrete section when it comes to analysis. But the other one was a little bit complicated. I'm talking about this case here. If you guys remember this, we have compression force, and the compression force was over three compression forces. If you remember that, 
Now our analysis is much simpler because we have just compression block. It's gonna be rectangular section. So I said here, here's ZF and here's ZW. At the end, here's the moment capacity. So you have the phi factor and then you have two moments. CF times ZF plus CW times ZW. At the end, of course, we divide by 12 to put it in Kepler. Any questions? Yes? I'm waiting for questions. So can you show us how you got uh, the C factor? Again, I kind of was lost on that. Professor, did you hear my question? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I, I asked, I didn't know if you heard me. I asked if you could go over how you got your fee factor. No, I did not. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Go ahead, please. Can, can you go over how you got your fee factor again, the 0.88? Okay, no problem. Now you have the C over D value, correct? Yes. Say so it's 0.386. Now, you have two ways of doing it. Either that you do it graphically, which is gonna be very tough, right? Or just use this equation. This one here. So you can use this equation if you want to. Meaning this equation here says that you're gonna start from this point, it's gonna be 0.65 plus the amount of increase that you have in here, which means the distance or the value of the fee factor from here to there. This amount of value here, see this? How do you figure this out? If you have the slope of this line, right? Times the C over D subtracting the 0.6. Professor, is that the same thing as DT over C? Or are they each being divided? It's C over D. So it is one divided by C divided by D. Okay. So is that the same thing as D divided by C? Or no, because there's not parentheses? No, because you just take one first and then divide first by C and then divide the whole thing by D. Okay. Okay. Any other questions before we start talk a little bit about the project? Yeah, for a story building, story height is gonna be 14 feet. 
We're going to be using the CBC 2019 California Bin Code, meaning ACI 314. We're going to be doing design for one way slab. So instead of having a homework about this lab, I'm going to take it from here. We're going to be doing the beams, we're going to be doing the columns, foundation, and pavement. So this gives you our scope of work. The concrete strength is giving us false. Look at this. So how about this? What is a 3,000 piece set? This about the soil. When it comes to foundation design, we'll need this number, but we don't need it now. It's going to be later. But here's the concrete trends. So when it comes to foundation, you'll be using, you'll be using 3,000. When it comes to columns, it's going to be 4,000. So don't ask me because you have it here in the design criteria. Load criteria, you have the self-weight of the structure members. Yeah, understand that. And then you have additional dead load of 10 PSF. Usually this 10 PSF is going to be for the ceiling, tiles, ducts, light fixtures, and everything that you may think about. The floor life load here is going to be 50 PSF as a life load. You have also partitions, and the partition weight is going to be 15 PSF as a life load. Someone's going to say, I thought that partitions gave you dead load. Am I correct? Partitions? I'm going to say, not in an office building. Being maybe if it is in residential, partitions give you there for a but in an office building, when you have concrete slab, you can change it at any time. That's why we consider the partition weight to be 15 PSF. Roof life load, 20 PSF. So when I do the roof design, should I consider 15 PSF for the partitions? Do we have partition on the rooftop? I say no. Only in the floor levels. But in the roof, no, we don't have it. Okay, good. So the first item that I need from you here's the floor plan of the building. A few grid lines, the X, same thing. A, B, C, D, E, you have the spacing. And then I'm going to show you here a plan that has the beams. I just marked this previously. So you have the beams, and then you have the slabs. All of the slabs here is going to be one way slab. Why? Because the span of it is going to be 26, this is going to be LX, and the width is going to be 28 divided by 3. So we're talking here about mine and one third. Let's say about nine feet. So when you have 26 divided by 9 feet, it's going to be more than 2. So I have here one way slab. So this yellow hatching here, it means that I'm going to be taking here a strip of the slab to design it. And in a case like this, I'm going to have here a continuous beam. We'll come to analysis. So instruction analysis, I'm going to have continuous beam, but this is going to be the slab. I hope that this makes sense. And you're going to have lots of supports. Support one is here two, three, four. So it's going to be continuous beam. When I have simply supported beam, the moment is equal to W squared divided by eight. Correct? The question is, when I have continuous beam, what should I do? I say, okay. This is taken here from the steel book. Someone's going to say steel. We're not working here steel. I understand that. But this is here. It's going to be for the moment diagram for continuous beam. When it's going to be three spans or more. So you don't really need to do structure analysis and spend the time to do it. But instead, here's the first moment. It's going to be positive moment. It's going to be negative moment. You see how they draw the moment? They do it on the tension side, opposite to what you guys are used to. So the first moment is going to be 0 0.08 W squared. Maximum negative moment is going to be W squared divided by 10. And now this is going to be the second possible moment. 
So in our analysis here, we'll need to design for two moments only. Could you please keep this in mind? I don't want you to spend more effort than needed. Is give me these two moments. Point 0.8 w squared and point 0.1 w squared. This is going to be the negative moment. This is going to be the positive moment. When it comes to slabs, usually we're going to have a positive and negative reinforcing. Positive reinforcing means it's going to be at the bottom of the slab. It's going to be here. Negative reinforcing giving the top of the slab. Where you get this load W is going to be W ultimate, the ultimate load. This is after you apply the load factors. So for this coming uh, homework, I'm going to call it a submit and I'm going to post it right after the lecture. And your job here is to design the one-way slab, which is a rectangular section, which you guys you have done it before. Your best way of doing it, if you just assume the minimum reinforcing and you start from there. I hope that you guys are listening well. I don't want you to use any other examples. If you are going to be using reinforcing bars, use either number five or number four. Limit yourself to number four and number five only. Okay. The spacing. Use 16 inch, 14 inch or 12 inches. Nothing more. No more options. So number four or five. The spacing, 16, 14, and 12 inches. Meaning, you can go with number 5 at 16, or number 5 at 14, or number 5 at 12, or number 4 at 16, number 4 at 14, number 4 at 12. And when you pick the reinforcing, pick the reinforcing, which is going to be very close to your mom demand. It's going to give you the mom capacity, which is very close to your mom demand. Make sense? Or no? You have a question, Brad? Um, yeah, I don't really understand what we're using the moment chart for. All right, good, all right, good question. And what negative reinforcement is? Okay. Look at this. I'm taking here a strip. This is not simply supported slab. Am I correct? Or this is a simply supported slab? Yeah. Which one? Continuous or simply supported? Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my what, head. What is a simply supported first? Like it's fixed in the X and Y direction at one end and just in the Y and in the other? Simply supported means it has only one span. This is a simply supported, like the one we have done in class. Very good questions, actually. Wait, so that, but that's, that has more than one span, right? Yeah. So it's not simply supported? This is not simply supported, this is called continuous. Okay. This is the way we call construction analysis, okay? Construction business. This one here is going to be simply supported, like the very simple thing, right? It has two supports, one single span, and that's it. And how much is the moment in this case? So a case like this, moment, if you remember, W, L squared, divided by 8. You remember that? Yeah. This is what we have used in, in the class. In this case here, this slab here is continuous. What does it mean by continuous? It means it has more than one span. Where are the support to the slab? You can say support to the slab is going to be here. It's going to be here, right? You have lots of supports, correct? So your slab here is continuous. And the moment diagram is not going to look like this, like just something like this. You remember the moment diagram that you guys have done? Something like this, right? Let's say a curve. I don't have this anymore. And instead, I'm going to have this. I need this. This works here when you have three or more spans. And they need to be equal. 
like in here. You see here, I even extended this so that you guys know what moment value is going to be there. And here's the moment diagram. So I give you the moment diagram in a case like this. Okay. Now your other question, what is negative reinforcement? What's possible reinforcement, right? When you have passive moment, you're gonna put the reinforcing here at the bottom. Why? Because you want the reinforcing to take the tension, correct? On the bottom of this girdle. Do you guys agree? And in this beam here, right in the middle, you're gonna put some reinforcing at the bottom. Why? Because you're gonna be taking the tension. But when you have negative moment, you're gonna have tension at the top. And the reinforcing is going to be on the top of the beam like this. It's going to be here, in this direction here. Let me look for another thing that I want to show you. Okay, so some parts of the beam are going to be in tension on the top just because of the, where the loads are placed. And then we just need to reinforce it at the top of the slab rather than the bottom. Yeah, I'm going to show a good example of that. Look at here. In this beam here, tension is given the bottom, right? So where do we put the reinforcing? We put the reinforcing here. Main reinforcing is given here. Take the tension. How about here when the tension is given the top? We put the reinforcing right here. And how about here? We put also in the top. We call this negative reinforcing, negative moment. We call this positive reinforcing, positive moment. So this is the reason that we use here the term positive and negative and reinforcing and the moment. We're good? Yeah, thank you. And then just uh, what what's like our final answer gonna look like? Okay. It's giving the design, meaning, if you remember here when we did the one-way slab, We put the loads, we put 10 PSF or 7 PSF here, right? Additional dead load. In our case, we're going to put 10. And in the live load, we're then just going to be using 50. We're going to be using 50 plus 15. You remember that? Um, So in the live load, we have partitions gonna be 15 for the live load, and then we have the floor live loads gonna be 50. In our case here, we have only 50. So here you're gonna be adding the 15 in your project. What did you do after that? You try some combinations. You said here's try number five at 16, right? So you can try any number you want. And what I said, how would you start with this number here? Why would you do number five at 16? Why don't you do number five, let's say at 14 inch or number four at 16 inch or number four at 12? 
what I said is start with the minimum reinforcement. You remember the minimum reinforcement here? Put the minimum reinforcement based on the combinations I gave you. Number four or number five, the spaces gave you 16, 14, 12. And what do you do after that? You follow this example. You prove to yourself that the reinforcing bars for the pattern that you're going to be using in this lab is going to be sufficient. It's going to be covering the mom demand, like in this case. So the final answer is going to look like this slide set. It's going to be this example here. You start from here, you do the demand, but you're going to change it according to the given information and the project information. You find out the moment. You propose some reinforcing to be able to cover the minimum and to cover the moment demand, and you prove it to the end. You need to prove this to us. You need to say, well, here's what happened. Make sense? OK, yeah, thank you. No problem. Professor, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Are we going to be making designing a slab for every level and the roof, or just a generic slab? For yeah, we're just going to do one, which is, is going to be on the floor for now. And once we review it together, and I feel that you guys are able now to understand it, we're going to expand it, and we're going to do the roof. We're going to do more checks on the slab. So this is just one test. It's going to be kind of worth testing it. We're testing the slab design and what we have learned here in this slide set. So just remember, it's going to be slide set number five. All right, guys, go ahead and sign out. Type your name in the chat room, and you can leave. You guys have a good night.